Well, saints, good evening and welcome to our Sunday online fellowship. Trusting that everybody's well and full of the joy of the Lord. And as I'm sure you can see, it is absolutely freezing here in George. Hence, I'm dressed like the abominable snowman. Uh, I wish we could put uh, heaters on and all those things. But uh, with the power crisis here in South Africa, uh, it's best not to run too many appliances at once. Well, tonight, for those of you who were with us last week, I said that we we're going to be speaking on a subject that was suggested by Galia, uh, and that was the inerrancy of Scripture, but in regards to believers, and especially around the subjects of the creation. So I'm not going to be doing a whole uh, apologetic series on the validity of Scripture as one would then argue with an unsafe person, but I want us to look at the subject of the inerrancy of Scripture for the born-again believer uh, regarding the creation account. Now, why is this important? Well, as Galia mentioned, uh, that the, the believers who do not believe in the literal interpretation of the account of creation in Genesis, and I've met a number of those over the, the course of, of, of my, my Christian walk, and I'm sure many of you have. And so there are a number of Christians who believe that the account of Genesis chapter, specifically chapters 1 and 2, is not to be taken literally. In other words, God did not create the heavens and the earth and all that are in them in a literal six days. So they see it either as allegorical or symbolic. And... Uh, of course, we need to, as, as believers, approach the subject and ask ourselves the question, is that true? And if it is true, how does that then affect the, w the way that we relate to all Scripture? Right, so what I'm not going to be doing, and because I believe in staying in my lane, each of us have got uh, gifts according to the grace of God, and I am not a scientist, I am not an intellectual. There are some incredible ministries which I have put in the description to this video. Just a few, there are, there are many others who are experts in the field of apologetics when uh, seeking to prove the creation account as opposed to the theory of evolution. So there are many, many uh, brilliant ministries and brilliant saints uh, who are, have got scientific degrees uh, and all sorts of other uh, physics degrees, etc., who are experts in discussing the subject of a literal creation as opposed to either uh, evolution or any other view on, on creation. So I've put links to their websites to in, in the description and I'm not going to try to go where I'm not gifted or equipped to go. So there are, as I said, I'm going to approach this from a pastoral perspective that if we have trouble accepting the literal interpretation of the, uh, the creation account, how then is it going to affect the way we perceive scripture? Right, so that's, I'm coming at it from that uh, viewpoint. Now, well, I have mentioned this in my testimony, although I don't share my testimony often, but if anybody has heard my testimony, they may might remember me uh, saying that when I was 12 years old, preparing for my bar mitzvah, as, as a Jewish young man, you spend a, a year in preparation for your bar mitzvah. That's over and above the seven years you spend in Hebrew school. Uh, I remember asking my rabbi the question, regarding creation, I asked him, how do we understand the creation account in Genesis in light of you know, evolution, the theory of evolution? And his response to me was quite shocking and it caused me to, to question my own faith as, as a Jew. And he said to me, David, we should never take the creation account in Genesis literally. So what he was saying is, like some Christians, that the the account of creation in Genesis should not be seen as a literal account. All right, so we're going to dive into, dive into this topic, and I'm going to break it up into seven, seven subjects or seven areas, okay? And uh, 
going to be looking at a lot of scripture. So I hope you have a pen at hand and uh, let's delve into this subject. How do we deal with believers who do not agree with the biblical account of Genesis, of the creation? All right, so let's start off and quote Genesis' own uh, description of itself. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 4, this is what the writer of Genesis, whom we assume to be Moses, he writes this. He says in Genesis chapter 2 verse 4, he says, This is the history, or some of you might have in your Bibles, this is the generations of the heavens and the earth. So after he, by the Holy Spirit, writes the first chapter, he's moved by the Spirit of God to say this is the generations, or you might say this is the sequence of events in God's creation. Now this is the sequence in how God created all things. He's not offering a scientific explanation. And as believers, when we, have, when we are either defending the Genesis account or the creation account, we must understand that nowhere in Genesis does God give a scientific explanation of how he created. All right. So the Genesis account is not a is it's not a description of how God created, it is a description of what God created and when God created. Very important. You get that? A description of what God created and when he created. In other words, it is a sequence of of events. It is a recording of the sequence of events of what God created and when he created them and it is not a scientific detailing of how God created. Now that's very important and we're going to get into that a bit later. But I want us to look at how the Bible, how the scriptures deal with the Genesis account. Now, this is really important because as born again believers, as people who are born of the Spirit of God, who profess to be children of the Most High God, we have one authority. We have an authority that is higher than any other authority, and that is the Word of God. And I just want to read one verse of Scripture from the Psalms. Actually, I'm going to be reading a lot of Scripture tonight. But there's one particular Scripture that I want to read as we commence this study tonight. And that's in Psalm 138 and verse 2. Psalm 138, verse 2. This is what David, by the Spirit of God, writes. He says this, and I'm going to read the second part of verse 2. He says, For you, speaking of God, for you have magnified your word above all your name. David, speaking of God, saying to the Lord that, Lord, you have magnified, you've exalted, you have glorified your word above all your name. Which means, saints, that to us, the word of God is our highest and our final authority. So when we look at the Genesis account, we need to examine what the rest of Scripture says regarding the account. And so I'm going to read three portions of scripture and you welcome in fact i encourage you to write down these references and especially those of you who have loved ones or you know folk who profess to be christians but do not believe in a literal six-day creation so we're examining what does the bible say of itself what do the scriptures say of it uh, regarding the genesis account taking into consideration that the scriptures were written by men as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so, especially under the Old Testament, they wrote what the Spirit of God dictated to them to write. They did not interpret events. They wrote as God instructed them. So the psalmist says in Psalm 33, verse 6, Psalm 33, verse 6, By the word of the Lord... The heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. So what does the psalmist say? By the word of the Lord, by God's spoken word, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. And that is, that is something that is repeated throughout Scripture. 
Moses writes in Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. Moses, who is attributed of writing the first five books of the Torah or the Pentateuch, writes this. And he says in Exodus 20, verse 11, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and he rested the seventh day. So what does Moses say? That the Lord made the heavens and the earth in six days, the sea and all that is in them. And again he says in Exodus chapter 31 and verse 17, speaking about the Sabbath, the day that God rested, the seventh day after he had created for six days, he says, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel. This is God speaking now in the first person regarding the Sabbath. He says that the Sabbath is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Now, this is really important, because in Exodus 31, verse 17, Moses is not writing an, an account of something, but he is dictating from the very mouth of God. Listen to the grammar. Uh, it is a sign between me. Moses doesn't say it is a sign between God and the children of Israel, but he's writing in the first person as the Spirit of God is dictating to him. He's saying, This Sabbath is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested. So God says of himself, right? God says, I created the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, in six days. In six literal days. And on the seventh day, God says, I rested. So this is not Moses speaking about what he perceives happened. This is God saying that he himself created all things in six literal days. So that should really end the discussion for any Christian who does not believe that or not believe in a literal six day creation. But as I said, there are seven uh, areas that I'm going to investigate tonight. All right, so that's the first. What does the Bible say of itself in regards to the creation account? And I've just read three scriptures. There are many more. And those three scriptures say, in six days, God created. And Stacy has just reminded us, I was going to get to it, but thank you, Stacy, you beat me to it, that in the Genesis account, in Genesis chapter 1, in the Hebrew, the Bible says, Vayahi Erev, Vayahi Boker. In other words, it was evening and it was morning the first day. So every for every day that God created, the Bible is very clear in saying it was in a one-day period. It was evening and it was morning the first day. It was evening and it was morning the second day. Vayahi Erev, Vayahi Boker, or Boker, right? And so, in the Genesis account, the language states that each day of creation was a period between sunset to sunset. Right, so from, from morning to evening. Yes, morning to evening. Okay, now, that is the first point. The second point is that there are some Christians who say, all right, we believe God created, but he, uh, he created the, the process. In other words, he, he, he made allowance for the process of creation and then allowed time to complete the process. Well, words, this is called theistic, rever sorry, theistic evolution. In other words, theistic evolution is that God started the process of evolution and over millions and millions, if not billions of years, uh, God had provided all the materials for life and over billions of years, these materials organized themselves into various forms and that gave birth to life. The typical Darwinism uh, concept of evolution. 
Right, so there are Christians who believe in theistic, theistic speaking of theos, God, God in evolution. Right. And so what they believe is that God did create all the matter in the universe and then left it to sort itself out. Now, the major problem with this, well, there's two major problems. The first major problem is that that statement contra contradicts scripture. God said he created the animals, he created every plant, he created every type of fish, every type of bird. God says that he created all things, that matter did not organize itself over billions of years to form life and, and vegetation. So theistic evolution contradicts the very word of God. But secondly, so there's three things, that there's three areas, three problems with theistic evolution. The first is it contradicts the word of God, and that should settle the discussion. But secondly is it relegates God to a limited God, that God is not all-powerful, that God was, is unable to create all that has been since the dawn of time. In other words, that God did not create the zebras and the lions and the trees and the fish. God just created the, the elements from which life could come and diversity of, of life would spring up, whether it's, 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 it's plant life or animal life, whether it's fauna or flora. And so if that is the belief, then it stands to reason that God himself is limited in his ability. And that, of course, is a contradiction of the very nature of God who declares himself to be omnipotent, that he is unrestricted and unlimited in might and in power. Stacy, have you seen my notes? You seem to be way ahead. <laughs> I'm going to be getting to that portion of Scripture as well. Okay. Now, the third problem with theistic evolution is... Where did death then come in? Because if we believe in the evolutionary model that the that over billions of years creatures uh, were formed, single cell organisms multiplied and become multi celled organisms, and the whole evolution spiel, uh, those life forms died. They died and were replaced by other life forms. And then when you had a multitude of life forms, they began to prey on each other. So death then would have preceded, come before Adam, if we believe in theistic evolution. So if there was a ex a extremely long period where, where life developed, then those, those living beings would have preyed on one another, and so death would have been around prior to the fall of Adam. This again contradicts the word of God. You know, Romans chapter 5 verse 12 says this, Romans 5 verse 12, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. And in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 21, Paul writes, For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection. And Paul will say in Romans chapter 8, that the whole creation has been subjected to futility because of the fall, and that the creation awaits the revealings of, revealing of the sons of God. So what the Bible says of itself is that up until... The fall of Adam, there was no death in God's creation. And that creation, not just Adam, Adam just didn't bring death to mankind, but Adam brought death to this creation. So prior to Adam's fall, there was no death, no death of animals and no death of people. So if you believe in theistic evolution, you're contradicting the very basis of scripture that death came through the fall so to believe in theistic evolution 
is to not believe in the very essence of the gospel that sin, Adam's sin, brought death not just to all mankind, but to this creation, which is why God has to recreate everything in perfection at the end of this age. So that's the problem with theistic evolution. And as Stacy reminds us, when God created, after he created, on each day he says, and God saw, and it was good. The Bible doesn't say God saw, and he says, it has the potential to be good. Or God saw, and it, he said, it's going to be good. No, the Bible says God created, and he looked upon the works of his hands, and he said, it is good. In other words, it implies very clearly that God created what he created in that one day period was good and it was perfect. So again, scripture contradicts the theistic evolution view. Now, let's now actually get into the Bible and look at what the scripture says of itself. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says, Bereshit bara Elohim et hashemayim et haaretz. All right. And so that should put our argument to bed. Okay. Let me translate that. Bereshit bara Elohim. Bereshit in the beginning. Created, bara, created, Elohim, God in the plural. So, in the beginning, created God, et hashamayim ve et haaretz. Now that word et, it's not in, is not translated in your scriptures. But if you've got a Bible program, and you go to your your King James, and you 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 look, uh, you, you you do a translation from the Hebrew to the English you'll notice that the word et is in brackets and it says there it is the sign of the def definite direct object and it is not translated into the English. So what does that mean? Well, that word et, interesting word, and this was pointed out to me recently by a good friend of mine, it's the direct or the, the definite direct object what it is, it, it points to it's what or it points to the object of the verb. So in the beginning, God created what? In the beginning, God created specifically the heavens and the earth. So in the Hebrew language, the first verse of the first chapter of the first book of God's word, it says that in the beginning, God specifically created the heavens. And God specifically created the earth. It does not say in the beginning God created matter in the hope that it would organize itself into some logical grouping that would result in planets and specifically the earth with atmosphere, with, with animals and creatures and, and, and weather patterns that can sustain the planet. No, the Hebrew itself says, in the beginning, God specifically created the heavens and he specifically created the earth. Now, that word et is also very interesting in another aspect because it's made up of two Hebrew words, aleph and tav. Aleph and tav. Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew uh, alphabet and Tav is the last. And it corresponds to what in the Greek? I'll give you a moment. I'm sure many of you got it right. It corresponds to the Alpha and Omega. Aleph and Tav. Aleph, first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Tav, the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, corresponds to Alpha and Omega. Well done. All right. Excellent. Who is the Alpha and Omega? The Lord Jesus Christ. And Stacy, this is obviously one of your hot topics, reminded us earlier on of John chapter 1. So we keep our place in Genesis 1 
and we go to John chapter 1 and we read the, the beginning of John's gospel as he was moved by the Holy Spirit. And this is what John the Apostle writes by the Holy Spirit and he says, in the beginning, in Hebrew, bereshit, in the beginning was the word, was who? Was the Aleph and Tav, was the Alpha and Omega. In the beginning was Jesus, who is attributed with being the agent of creation. All things were made by him, all things were made through him, and all things were made for him. Who is the agent of creation? Jesus. So in the beginning, Bereshit. It's exactly how Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 starts. In the beginning was the word. Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning was the Word who created, the Word created. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 2, He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life. In Him who created was life. And the life was the light of the man. Do you see that, saints? Is that what John does is he begins his gospel by tying Genesis with Jesus. That in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning was the word. He was the agent of creation. It was God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit purposed for there to be a creation, but Jesus was the one who was the agent of creation, as the Bible says over and over and over again. He was with God in the beginning, and all things were made through him. So do you think that Jesus just said, well, I can't do all this. I'm going to just create the elements that one day, over billions of years, are going to sort themselves out and hopefully... If my calculations are correct, they're going to sort themselves out the way they should do. And there's going to be a man called Adam. And there's going to somehow be a tree of life that's going to create itself. I mean, it's bizarre to even think that. It, it's absolutely insanity. All right. To, to think that. So do you see how John chapter, chapter 1 verses 1 through 4 corresponds perfectly with the Genesis account in Genesis 1 verse 1. Right, so uh, Keith, you mentioned Leviticus chapter 24, verse 17, so I'm going to quickly uh, go there and read it before we move on. Uh, Leviticus chapter 24, verse 17, and, and Keith says, let me just see if I've got the right... Keith, have we got the same reference here? Oh yes, sorry, Keith, yeah, <laughs> good reference. Whoever kills any man shall surely be put to death. Whoever kills an animal shall make it good. Animal for animal. Well, there you go. Thank you, Keith. Very good scripture. Whoever kills any man shall surely be put to death. And so what happened to the... Uh, you might say, well, the Neanderthals weren't men. But uh, whoever kills an animal shall make it good. So the law is based on the fall. Right? So until... Prior to the fall, there was no need for law because there was no death. So, great, uh, great scripture there, Keith. All right, uh, Louis uh, quotes for us Hebrews chapter 4, verse 7, and we're going to take a, a sneak pre We're going to be looking at Hebrews in a moment. All right, so we see then that the, 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 the third point is that, again, the New Testament deals with the Genesis, uh, with the creation narrative as being that Jesus specifically created all things perfectly and he was the giver of life. That life didn't emanate by chance, but it was purposely given by the, uh, by the Lord. Okay. And of course, now, uh, what Stacy writes here, and very really important, is and uh, it's it's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the second law of thermodynamics she's quoting as one goes forward in time in a closed system 
there's a disorder or entropy, entropy, entropy increases, and scientists find this as the law of thermodynamics. Right, there you go. Okay, so the, the, the very idea that we're evolving is actually contrary to, to science, is that in, in a closed system, which we are in, things order to decay. In other words, things will progress to decay, not to improvement. Things do not get better. Things get worse. And if you don't believe me, go paint your house and see what happens in a few years' time. All right. It doesn't stay the same. It gets worse. Okay. It, it begins to atrophy. Right. So, again, I don't want to get too scientific uh, because I'll leave that to the experts, but I want to approach this from a biblical perspective. So the fourth point is Satan is the one who always seeks to undermine the very word of God. Anybody who believes in a theistic evolution or anybody who doubts the Genesis account, and I'm, I do not mean to be unkind, but this is going to be a harsh rebuke. Anybody who does not believe in a literal Genesis account is entertaining the deception of Satan. Now you say, well, David, how can you say that? Well, I say that on the basis of Scripture. You see, Satan's greatest ploy is to get mankind to question the validity of God's Word. And a perfect example is right in the beginning, when Satan tempts Eve and he says to Eve, has God said that in the day you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he says you will surely not die. So he, he causes doubt in Eve's mind. And that doubt then eventually leads her to disobeying God. When Jesus, our Lord, was tempted by Satan in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, what did Satan do? He misappropriated the word of God. So in Eve's case, he twisted the word. He, he made her to doubt the word of God. When he tries to tempt Jesus, what does he do? He misrepresents the word. And this is what Satan does. Has God said? So for people who do not believe in a literal six-day creation, it's because they are listening. I'm talking about believers. I'm not talking about the unsaved. I'm talking about believers who do not believe in a literal six-day creation. They are being blinded by Satan with the same temptation that he used with Eve and tried to use with Jesus. Has God said and the answer should be as jesus answers say satan it is written six days god created the heavens and the earth and on the seventh day he rested that should be our response not questioning the validity of the word of god the fifth point and this should again settle any arguments is that the Bible tells us that every word of Scripture is inspired by God. I'm going to just read three portions of Scripture and write down these references. Psalm 119, verse 160. Psalm 119, verse 160. The entirety... Of your word is truth. This is what the psalmist writes. The entirety, all your word is truth. Not Genesis chapter 3 onwards is truth, and perhaps not all of Job is truth. No, the entirety from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through to the book of Revelation, the entirety of your word is truth. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5. Every word of God is pure. 
every word of God is pure. That word pure in the Hebrew, tsaraf. Tsaraf. T-S-A-R-A-P-H. Tsaraf. T-S-A-R-A-P-H. It means to be pure. It means to be refined. It means to be tried. In other words, tested. So every word of God has been tried, tested. It is pure. It is refined. And of course, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture, not some scripture. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now, I want to... I want to just specifically look at one area that the Word of God is profitable for, for doctrine. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. So the doctrine of the creation, if all Scripture is profitable for that doctrine, then it means that because the entirety of God's Word is truth, if the word of God is pure and tried and tested, it means that Genesis chapter chapters 1 and 2 are literally correct. That in a period of six literal days, God created all that is on the earth and all that is in the heavens. Okay. And now, as we begin to move towards a bit of a close, a close I want us to remind ourselves of the book of Job. Job, as we know, was afflicted by the enemy as God permitted. And he went through tremendous trials, tremendous loss. And he began to bemoan his, his, his fate and began to speak about the nature of God, whether God was, was, was doing right by Job. Eventually, a young man by the name of Elihu comes to God, uh, sorry, comes to Job, and he says to Job, Job, can you truly understand the wisdom, the magnificence of God? Do you, can you try to, do you think you can understand how God does what he does? Because Job and his friends were trying to work God out. Just like evolutionists try to disprove God because they cannot rationalize that there exists a being so great, so powerful, that he could have created all things, nevertheless, sorry, never mind, just created them by speaking them into existence. Their rational minds can't comprehend God. So when the wisdom of men seek to understand God, their wisdom becomes foolishness. So how does God respond to Job, who's trying to figure God out? And this is, I want to read just a few portions of Scripture. In fact, just two portions of Scripture. The first one is in Job 38. I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. At the end, towards the end of the book of Job, Job's trying to rationalize God, trying to understand God. I can't believe God would create in six days. Now, Job doesn't say that. I'm just... Um, using poetic license, as some Christians say, I can't believe God is, is able to do uh, what the Bible says. This is, what Job, this is what God says to Job. Job 38, reading from verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Uh, 21st century English. Who is this that's talking rubbish? Okay. So... God says to Job, who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Who laid its cornerstones? And so God just grills Job and he says, Answer me. You know, 
Where does the rain come from? Where does the hell come from? God says to Job, I'm going to ask you some questions now and you're going to have to give me an answer now. Obviously, how on earth can any man answer God and tell God, well, look, this is how you made everything. Well, eventually, after God lambastes Job, and rightly so, after God humbles Job, the Bible says in Job, sorry, yes, in Job chapter 42, I'm going to read six verses, Job 42, verses 1 through 6. Then Job answered the Lord and said, when Job's arrogance, his ignorance of God's might and ability is exposed by the Lord, Job says, I know that you can do everything. I know that you can do everything. Sadly, there are Christians who profess to be Christians who don't know that God can do everything. They are unable to believe that God can create all things in six days. I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Listen to Job's response after being questioned by God. He says, I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said, I will question you, and you shall answer me. And Job's response says, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore I abhor myself, and I repent in dust and ashes. There are a lot of Christians who refuse to believe the literal Genesis account, who need to repent before God, because the God that they profess to serve is not the God of the Bible. And one then wonders what kind of faith can such believers have if they're unable to trust the validity of scripture when scripture says of itself every word is pure and true when scripture itself acknowledges the genesis account both in the old testament and in the new testament how can such a christian proclaim to have faith there's a scripture i want to read in hebrews chapter 11 this will be the last scripture of the evening in hebrews chapter 11 verse 3 that we know that Hebrews 11 is a chapter on faith. It's, 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 it's the hall of fame for all the men and women of faith. And this is what the writer of Hebrews says in Genesis chapter 11 verse 3. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. By faith we understand, not by our intellectual uh, fortitude not by our scientific understanding but by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of god so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible now if that does not contradict theistic evolution or evolution itself that the worlds that was are seen were made of things which are invisible so it is was the invisible that made the visible and we understand this by faith now the best that evolutionists can do is they say that in the beginning there was this chunk of matter and that matter exploded well when that became too bizarre they came up with another theory which was even more bizarre and this was this is the latest theory that in the beginning there was nothing nothing became something Something exploded, which created the building materials of the universe. So that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? You see, they cannot acknowledge God. So when their first theory that in the beginning there was a lump of matter, the lump exploded, and that was 
created the building materials for the universe through the process of evolution. When that was too bizarre for people to, to, to believe, they came up with an even more bizarre theory. In the beginning was nothing. Nothing became something. Something exploded. Whereas the Bible tells us that by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen are not, were not made with things that are visible. And that should be the end of the matter. So for a Christian, to, to sum up, and then I'll go to some of your, your um, comments and if there are any questions, but to sum up, for a Christian to deny the creation account of Scripture is to deny the accuracy of all Scripture. If there is one error in the Word of God, then the Word becomes tainted. And this is really very important. If we cannot believe Genesis chapter 1 and 2, why should we believe John 3, 16? Why should we be believe, believe Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10? Why should we believe anything in the Bible? How do I know that salvation is by faith? You say, because Jesus said it. <laughs> well, Jesus said in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And if you don't believe that, what else do you not believe that Jesus said? So do you see, saints, for anybody professing to be a Christian, who denies the literal interpretation of Genesis chapter 1 and 2, they then have a problem in believing the rest of all Scripture. So I uh, hope that that is then helpful as Galia specifically answer, asked the question tonight, and I hope it's been uh, helpful to you again. I am not approaching this scientifically. I have in the description, you'll see there are links to, I think I've put four or five really good ministries that have huge resources uh, debunking the theory of evolution from a scientific perspective. So these are uh, highly acclaimed scientists and, and physicists who, who debunk uh, evolution from a scientific uh, perspective. All right, and that's why I encourage you to look at that. But I'm dealing with it as more in a pastoral uh, manner. Okay, so if there are any other questions, I'm going to or, uh, please type them up. I'm just going to go through some of your um, of your comments. So we're going back to to Louis. Uh, Louis, I, I just skimmed over your your um, comments, so let me just read it carefully. Another powerful argument regarding the literal Sabbath is Hebrews 4 verse 7. He again defines a certain day, saying through days, so as long as time after. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. I understand what you're saying, Louis. Well, I don't understand what you're saying. So maybe just, just if, you can, if you can rephrase it for us. Uh, Stacy writes, our love for God should produce a love for his truth. Absolutely. One might be, uh, be safe still believing in evolution, but hopefully the love of God's truth will move us to search out what God says. That's very good. And I think Stacy brings up a really good point for those of you that don't have the live, the live uh, chat. Is chat uh, Stacy saying is, we can come to faith believing in evolution, but as we go through Scripture, our perspective should change if we have a love for the truth. If we know God's word is truth, therefore if we love God, God's word, then as we go through scripture, our previous position should be not just challenged, but changed. Okay. Yeah, Louis, I understand. Sorry, going back to Louis. I understand uh, today is the day of salvation. I'm just trying to see how it ties into uh, the literal. Ah, oh, you're talking about the Sabbath day. Sorry, Louis, got you. Okay, you're talking about the Sabbath day. Okay, now I understand what you're saying. Okay. Good. Well, saints, that's it from, from my side. Uh, again, I hope it was informative, and especially Galia, uh, it was your 
request that we, we cover this, this, this subject. And so I hope that it has been uh, informative and certainly helpful. As a born-again believer, we must accept every verse of Scripture to be true. If there's one exception, then the Word of God is imperfect, and our God is a perfect God, so there can be no imperfection with Him. Good. So that's it from my side, and uh, all that remains is for me to say God bless and uh, good night until we meet again next week. May the Lord be with you.